In this video, we're going to discuss the rate law. Now, the rate law is an expression that shows how a reaction depends on the concentration of the reactants. Now, in a previous video, we saw that the rate of a reaction is going to depend on the concentration of the reactants, right? We can define the rate as the rate of disappearance of our reactants. So we know that there's some proportionality between the concentration of the reactants and the reaction rate. The key of, or the point of the rate law is defining that proportionality and making it an equation, right? So I wanna bring back this, this um, chemical equation that we were looking at in the previous video, right? This reaction, the decomposition of NO2 into uh, nitrogen monoxide and oxygen gas, right? So looking back at this process, right? We In the last video, we said, okay, I know I can say that the rate of this reaction is gonna be related to the disappearance of the reactants, right? So it's gonna be negative one half, the rate of change of the concentration of NO2 over time, right? Putting this negative sign here because NO2 is a reactant, it's going to be disappearing as this reaction goes uh, in further in time, right? That concentration is gonna be going down. So we put this negative sign here to compensate for that so that the rates are always positive, right? So we know that there's going to be this, um, th th so we know that there's gonna be this proportionality between the rate and NO2, right? So we can write out a proportionality statement we know that the rate of the reaction is going to be proportional to the concentration of NO2, right? And for any reaction, its rate is going to be proportional to the concentration of the reactants, right? What the rate law seeks out to do is to build an equation based on this proportionality. So the way that it does this is with the introduction of two things, a reaction rate constant and a rate order, right? So let me write out how this equation will look. So the rate is gonna be equal to K, which is gonna be our reaction rate constant times the concentration of our reactant raised to the power N. That N power is gonna be our reaction order, right? So let's kind of point out what we have here, right? So this rate, it's self-explanatory, the rate of the overall rate of the reaction, right? K is our reaction rate constant. So reaction rate constant. And this reaction rate constant is actually directly proportional to the speed of the reaction. So, um, so faster reactions will have a higher reaction rate constant and slower reactions will have a slower reaction rate constant, right? So, um, so it's directly proportional to the, the rate of the reaction as this equation would suggest. And N is going to be the rate order. So rate order. Right. So what do we mean by rate order? What does that mean? Well, this is basically telling you how much the rate is dependent on the concentration of your reactant. Right. So let's say, for example, N is equal to zero, which it can be right. N, N could be equal to zero here. If N is equal to zero, we call that a zero order reaction. Right. But what that means in practice is that the reaction has no dependency on the concentration of the reactant. Right. If N is zero here, then, you know, anything raised to the zero power is going to be one. So that means it has no effect on the actual um, on the actual rate. The concentration has no effect on the actual rate, this concentration of your reactant. Now, if N is equal to one, that would be a first order reaction or first order rate law. And what that would mean is that your uh, rate has a linear dependence on the concentration of the reactant, right? If it's raised to the first power, then it has a, a linear um, uh, a linear dependence on the rate of that reactant. Now, if N is equal to two, that would be a second order reaction, right? And that would mean that the rate has a quadratic dependence on the, on the concentration of the reactant, right? And obviously this number can go on and on and on. These three, zero order, first order, and second order are the three that you would really have to be concerned with throughout your studies of, of chemistry for the most part, throughout really your whole undergraduate career. Um, you know, these are the most common 
types of rate dependencies that we see throughout chemistry. Of course, there are special cases. There are weird cases <laughs> where you'll see something higher than a second order reaction. But uh, for the most part, practically speaking, definitely for any general chemistry course, but mostly throughout your whole undergraduate studies of chemistry, zero order, first order and second order. If you've got a good understanding of those three reaction rates, uh, rate orders, then you should be fine. OK, so one one other thing I want to say about this rate order. Um, very important. You can't determine this from the stoichiometry. You can't just look at a reaction and say, oh, I know that's going to be first order or second order. There's some rules of thumb you can establish throughout time. But in general, the rate order must be determined experimentally. So must be determined experimentally. Right. So you have to actually do the reaction. You have to see how the concentration depends on the rate and actually determine it experimentally doing some sort of fitting. It cannot just be determined. You can't just say, well, because there's a two in front of this, it's going to be a second order reaction. That, that's not how this works. It has to be determined experimentally. You've got to actually look at some data or you got to actually do the experiment in order to determine what the rate order for a given reaction is going to be. OK, so uh, there are two different um, rate laws that we will investigate. So there are two types of rate laws. Right. So the first is called the differential rate law. Right. And this this rate law just solely depends on it shows the, how the concentration uh, affects the rate. Right. So it shows how. Concentration affects rate. Right. So we already have uh, for this reaction, right, we have this definition of the rate. Right. Well, we've got this rate of change over time and let's just say it's a first order reaction. Then the differential rate law would look like this. For this reaction, if it's first order, right, you have the rate of the reaction in terms of its rate of change and the concentration of the original substance. Right. So this would be a differential rate law. Right. Uh, for those people who are mathematically inclined, it's called a differential rate law because it's technically a differential equation. Right. It actually defines how this concentration uh, affects the rate of the reaction. Now, if we have a differential rate law, then we also have an integrated rate law. So an integrated rate law. And this really shows how the concentration changes over time. So how concentration changes over time. So I won't get into much detail about the integrated rate law. There will be a whole video about that for really each of these rate orders. But uh, essentially, again, for my mathematically inclined people, um, the, the integrated rate law is just integrating both sides of this differential equation with respect to time. Right um, now, you won't. I, I might show you that, but that's not something that you would be responsible for at the general chemistry level. But um, just as far as your understanding and how calculus can seep into your chemistry, um, this uh, this integrated rate law comes from integrating these differential uh, these differential rate laws. Right, but both are important. Right, it's uh, it's important to establish how the concentration affects the rate of the reaction. Right, that's really the first step. Depending on you know what you're doing experimentally, your first step is to figure out okay um, how is the concentration changing the rate of this reaction, right? If I add more, if I start with a more concentrated solution, what happens if um, and then your, your real second goal of business is to become come up with an equation to really define how the concentration changes over time, which is really powerful. That means if you have a really slow reaction, um, then you can actually make an accurate prediction of how long it'll take to get to a certain point, right? Uh, if you have something that's taken days. 
right? You can say, okay, I can leave this for five days and be able to come back and have, you know, however much of my solution present, right? So, so these, both of these are really powerful, but that integrated rate law really gives you that predictive power to look into the future and say what the concentration of your reactant is going to be. Okay. So, so this is just a general introduction to rate laws. Again, this is something we'll circle back to when we start talking in more detail about integrated rate laws. In the next video, what I want to look at is uh, looking at some actual example problems using some of these rate equations in order to solve some problems, uh, given some data.